So you say it's good to be in church, right? No, it's not just something to say, it's true. I, I'm so thankful to be in the house, um, gathered together with, with other believers. There's something that happens, the Bible talks about how when we gather, there's something, there's a draw, there's really, a, there's a pull, the Bible talks about a pull uh, from heaven um, that happens as we gather uh, and seek the Lord. And uh, here's the cool thing is, is that this morning you're here not to hear from me. Thank you, Jesus. Give a shout for that. You're here to hear. Someone was really excited about that, apparently. Amen. You're here to, God has a word just for you. He has direction, and his word is amazing. It brings light uh, to our paths, uh, to our feet, shines ahead, and uh, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we get to hear together what the Lord would want to say to us, um, and it'll bring uh, great impartation, uh, direction for our lives, brings peace, brings wholeness. I was sitting in worship this morning, and um, <clears throat> during first service, uh, we, uh, at the end of service, it was just, it was really special, um, and just uh, praying, uh, just the healing, I don't know how to explain it, maybe uh, if you would understand this, this, the healing anointing uh, seemed to, to, to arrive, if you will, um, laying hands on people, and, uh, and, and yet uh, during worship, um, we are uh, just praise in the Lord, you know, and I just was hearing in my heart just where God shows up, where two or more gathered, there he is, and where God shows up, light is, and where light is, darkness can't dwell. So if there's darkness in your body, if there's sickness at all, if there's a, listen, if he's here, listen, he's here. He's not if, it's, it's, a, it's a promise. And so you can't show up where he is at and not leave changed. Like darkness can't occupy the place that light does. And so even just in your, in your bodies, I just saw bodies being healed this morning um, just while we were worshiping the Lord, just, it just was a work. So maybe that was for you, just receive that. Thank you, Lord. There's a promise in his word. You know he doesn't change? If he, if he, if he, if he was a healer, he is a healer, and he will be a healer. Because that's who he is. He doesn't change. Amen? So hey, uh, we're, we're going to be ministering together uh, this morning. Um, and, and, but before we jump into the word, uh, we want to give, uh, make it, uh, I guess it would be an announcement, but you want to start it out with that verse or how do you want to do that? I mean, it's up to you. That's, she's pulling it up. Um, but we're going to be making just, uh, I, I'm, I'm really bad at making announcements. So I know these guys in the front row, um, I got, I got Jake, uh, Lego, he's my brother and Landon Parker, uh, and both of these are like executive pastors here. They're really, really sharp, articulated, and all this kind of stuff. And I, they sit on the front row sometimes, and I'm like, I'm just more like the heart guy, like, hey, you know, throw it out there. And they're like, hey, don't forget this, and don't forget that. And anyway, and so here I am up here just talking, waiting, and stalling. And Sorry. <laughs> My thing was on the wrong, wrong verse, but Praise the 1 Lord Corinthians Jesus 12. Praise the Lord Jesus Nazareth. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 12. So this is... Um, Paul likens uh, an actual body to the body of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll start in verse 14. It says, For the body does not consist of one limb or organ, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, would it be therefore not a part of the body? If the ear should say, Because I am not the eye, I do not belong to the body, would it be therefore not a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit, and with the best adaptation. And so um, this verse just speaks, like I said, to the body of Christ and likens it to a body. And how many of you know in your body there's lots of organs, right? There's lots of parts. And each one doesn't do the same thing, right? Yeah. But it's easy for us as individuals to compare ourselves to another person and say, well, they're really gifted with this, or, or they really have this, and I wish I had that. But you know what that does then? You'd, you aren't your part. And therefore, the body is suffering because of that. Well, the same is true in the whole body of Christ. We can liken also the body to the whole entire body of Christ. And you know, in that body of Christ is individual ministries and churches And you know what? All of those churches and ministries are different. And you know what? That's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're not like the road down the church or like the, like. I'm glad we're not like the road down the church. I just got that like five seconds after I said it. 
Like the church down the road is what I meant to say. I was talking so fast, I didn't even catch up with myself till like five seconds later. Okay, but we're not designed to be that way. But that doesn't mean we are hard on that church or hard on that ministry and say what they're doing, oh my gosh, right? That would be tearing down the body. We have to know our own call, but we also have to ex- like lift up lift up the other parts of the body and say, you know what, they're called to this and they're doing awesome. But you know what, we're called to this. And so we're going to focus on our part because when we do our part as beyond church in the body of Christ, guess what? The whole body of Christ is strengthened. And there's something about owning our spot. There's something about being settled, not in a bad way, but in a way of honor and weight that, you know what, the part I carry in the body of Christ as Beyond Church is significant and it carries weight. My individual part within Beyond Church, within the body of Christ, is significant. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, I don't know why I'm just goofy right now. But um, yeah, as pastors, you know, you use the scripture to clarify what you're about to say. But at the end of the day, um, what I, we wanted to talk about is simply this, that we have been over the last little bit, I mean, after nine years, kind of discovering who we are as a church, and just you learn like, hey, what the picture of success is, is simply doing what God has said and, um, and, and being led from your, from your heart. And, you know, uh, over the last six months, I've been talking about really since June, the Lord's been dealing with me about just the power and the significance of the altar um, and, and, and just who we are as a church, that we don't have to look like everybody else, like you were saying. And, um, and then just as we were coming out of summer, uh, just feeling like we need to be speaking to one body, like one, you know, one family. And so we did that as we came into the fourth quarter. We, t- we changed this service time to tighten it up to make us feel a little tighter um, and a little closer where there would be this exchange coming and going. But it's like inside, that's not what, uh, what the direction really was. And, and, and how many of you know when the Lord, you know, speaks something to your heart, you can reason it away and you can tell you all the reason why not to, and you know, like God, you are a God that goes from glory to glory, right? And so we have this picture in our mind what glory to glory looks like, and you know, bigger, better, badder, you know, like like all the, you know, corner office, now I own the building kind of deal. Um, we have this idea and said, God just, he's about assignment, and assignments change as the seasons change. They're all significant if you're just simply doing what God has said. So I'm saying all that to say this, where instead of having two services, we're going to go to one service at 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> Yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, hey, I'm a punk. So I mean, like you, like everybody doesn't need explanation, but we just always want to, uh, we want to give you the best explanation of of our heart, and just endeavor to say, Lord, what are you saying? And just we know that you know, as I was arguing with the Lord, and I didn't call it that at the time. I just said, Well, Lord, you know, you don't. We have our best fight. We're our best. Our, we're at our best financial picture we've ever been. Finance, our, our savings accounts better than it's ever been. Our, our numbers are better than they were. You know, like all these things. And the Lord's like, uh, but what did I ask? Like, what, what's in my heart? It's like, go back to one. And, and, um, and so I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. And so we're going to do that if, uh, as of December 1st um, at 10 o'clock. So it's only two weeks, you know. So rather than waiting to make a scheduling and da 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 no, we're just going to finally obey, right? And so, uh, and we're going to go to 1 at 10 a.m. starting December 1st. So everybody say December 1st. December 1st. Everybody say 10 a.m. So it's going to be exciting. Um, but we're excited about even some of the, uh, you know, even just kids' classes just pumped full. Um, we're excited just about, in our hearts, about just what God is doing here in this house. And as I was sitting in the deer stand this last week, um, I, I, I went, ran over to Oklahoma. Uh, this was my 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 week to hunt, which is the middle of the rut, like it's the one I schedule all year, and I ended up only being there for two days, um, frankly, because I just wanted to be home uh, at the beginning part of it, and so I hung hung out, and I then I came back two days early, um, so I was only over there two days, but I get over into the deer stand, and uh, it was so cold. How many of you remember how cold it was Monday? Like it was. So cold. And wind and rain, I'm like three hours north or three hours west and north. And, uh, and the wind and the rain was blowing sideways there and it had froze uh, of this blind that I had gotten in, all the windows shut. 
So I get up into this blind and I'm like trying to use a lighter to open up the blinds. You don't even know all this, need to know all this. But I'm just telling you a story, right? Stories are good. You guys are all like, I'm like trying to unfreeze the windows. I mean, my, I'm thinking I'm going to blow up the lighter because it's getting so hot it's turning orange and I can't get the windows open. And I'm like, I've got a two hour sit still and I can't hunt here. And I'm like, should I get down? And I'm like, no, I'm going to make some phone calls. So I'm sitting in the deer stand, looking out the windows. If a big buck walks up, I can't shoot it, but I'm on the phone. Anyway, so I'm on the phone, and I was talking with uh, Trey Bollinger. He's on our board here, and um, we were talking a little bit about hunting and, and then also talking about just uh, two services and one service and just, you know, following the leading of your heart. And, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm pumped for you guys. I'm pumped for, for that. Is there something about when he was pastor, he said there was something about when we went back to one, having been at two, um, how it was like the logs in the fire, though they were still glowing, there was something that happened when we, when we laid them back together. There was just a, a rise of, the, uh, uh, of like almost a bonfire effect, and, and it seemed to draw people from the north, south, the east, and west. And, 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 I, and I, we were just talking about, you know, man, that's the word of the Lord to this, this house and, and all these kind of things. And it just got me that much more jacked up on, on following the leading of the Lord. And he's like, man, people come from miles to come to the bonfire where people, you know, are going to be. And I was like, yeah, and just got me excited of just even following what the Lord was, was saying. And um, so I'm just sharing that with you. December 1st, 10 a.m., uh, we're going to be going just to one service. So you better get here if you want to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you better read that sign as you walk into the door again, which is your expectation is an invitation for God to move because God's moving. There's something, that, there's something powerful about coming together, you know? There's something powerful about um, uh, being in the place that God's called you, not just for you, but for, for, for the, uh, the person next to you, the, for the one that you're going to bring, for the one that you're going to bring. And last night I shared uh, with, our, with our B team at uh, B Team Thanksgiving, which was amazing, by the way. Um, but we, I was just sharing uh, out of uh, right at the end out of Hebrews, and we was talking about the power of fans, right? And we're going to get into the message here in a moment. Um, but the power of those those voices in our life, we need to know as a team. We need to know our coach's voice. We need to know what the clock is, right? If we because in the clock and day in which we live is at the end, right? Like we're we need to know we're at the two last two minutes. And so how we you know hearing the coach's voice or, or our father's voice, knowing the time, but also. Um, um, remember and, and listen to your fans. Remember that, that you have some fans. Remember that they're, they're like they're, they're, as you see the day approaching, Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't forsake the assembling. Hebrews 11 shows us a picture of some of the fans that didn't quit, the heroes of faith. And then Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, it says, let us, let us uh, fit, since there is such a great cloud of witnesses or fans that are above us, let us throw off the sin and the things, the weights that so easily entangle us and let us run with perseverance. So there's something about that all this in Hebrews, he's talking about how the, the, the assembly or those that are on your team or those that are wearing the same jersey, you know, whether they're in the stands or, what, you know, grandstands of heaven or they're down here, right here, right next to you, hooked arm to arm. There's something powerful uh, that happens when we, when we get hooked up together as the day's approaching, as the pressure, the Bible says, it's going to become greater. This is why you need to assemble. This is why we need to remember that there's those that didn't quit and all of Hebrews chapter 11 and there's something that happens it says in Hebrews 12 1 there's an endurance that takes place there's a strengthening that takes place when we remember the fans and we fix our eyes Hebrews 12 2 on Jesus the author and perfecter the finisher of our faith there's something that happens and it goes on to say in verse 12 and 13 there's something that happens it says that our our weak hands or our our, our feeble hands and weak knees in other words the wore out. How many of you ever just had your grip just wore out? Your grip on the hope that you had. There's something about, he says, that, that, that the assembly it strengthens the hands. It strengthens the knees. You, when you're wore out and, you know, you're, you're, you're wet, you're wringing out sweat because you've been in the game, it's at the end and, and all this, but, but you hear the roar of the crowd. You hear somebody, you know, somebody comes up and taps you on the butt. I saw this picture on Facebook of a UCLA fan. Maybe you saw it. He said, this is a, someone said, this is the only friends that I surround my life with. And the guy must have did something where he, he got his head down and somebody ran up and put his head up, you know. There's something about those people. 
people that will strengthen you and, and encourage you, what? Strengthen your, your hands and your knees to finish the race. And it goes on to say, and build roads so that that the lame could be healed. So there is a hope. There's, there's, if you found Christ, if Christ has found you rather, and, and, and you made arrangements to come, you, you arranged your life and you said, God, I'm going to serve you. you. He said, well, listen, assemble, come together, listen to those around, uh, come, come around you, hook up and, and strengthen your hands and strengthen your knees, assemble and build a road. Why? So that the lame, those that are sick, those that haven't found that there is no hope, right? They would be, they'd find hope, they'd find healing, they'd find, it's something about, that. there's something about us assembling and even your ability to run. How it, and, and create a road and a pathway, you'll look back and you'll see that these people are walking, but walking behind you where they couldn't walk, where there wasn't hope, where there wasn't life because you strengthened your knees, because you strengthened your hands, because, and how did this happen? Because you assembled, because, because there was a gathering uh, and, and there's those in the crowd. Uh, and so there's something about gathering. Uh, even more than just for you. So just remember when the Lord has asked you to do something and he tells us as you see the day approaching, maybe it's not just for you. Maybe it's the fact that when you come in and your expectation is an invitation for God to move and the lack of honor in a hometown, how many of you know it, it, it sealed it for a town? How many of you know great honor in an assembly can seal it for a town? Huh? Huh? It's a fact, Jack. Right, let's get with it. All right, so we're teaching the Word this morning. Um, And so we're going to, here's the title of this morning's message. Um, As we were uh, teaching last night and and come uh, come back, Pastor Evan was going to be ministering Sunday morning. and, And after last night, she's like, hey, I think we should talk about what you started to talk about. And it fits everything with what I was going to talk about. And, and I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. And so here's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to talk to this idea or this thought that uh, we were talking last night to our team, um, our B team. Uh, and if you're not on it, here's a plug. Get on it. Man, use that gift. Let every, every person that's assembled and called to the body of Christ, let, them, let us use our gift to serve one another. That's scripture. All right, so get on that place, get hooked up, man, those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they, they don't see when the drought comes, they're like a tree planted by a river, glory to God, that's, that's, that's God's hope and his promise and his picture for your life, by design, he sets uh, those in the body, so I'll tell you, but we were talking to our team last night, and just the sanctuary was filled with tables, and, 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 and we, were, we were sitting up here, and last night I was Nate Saban. Because we don't have a hog coach right now, otherwise I would have used a hog coach, maybe. Um, but, but in other words, we, we, we came into the living room of, or the Thanksgiving dinner, kind of like you would see a coach do when they're trying to, you know, recruit a, a number one player. And let me just tell you, you're a number one player to God. You are a number one recruit. Like, like guess what? God's after you. So, like, think of this. Bama wants you, right? But so does LSU. So does Satan, right? I mean, or, you know, not. <laughs> well, you know, I got some friends, you know, that, that are, or I thought called maybe. Anyway, so, like, you are a number one recruit. Like, Satan's after you, too. You, you are a number one recruit. And so we were sitting there, and you know what happens when the coach comes? He brings, uh, you know, the gift of, like, you know, the jersey or a hat or whatever, and he begins to talk about what they're going to be doing at Bama or where they're going to be doing there, and they bring a culture. We're a winning culture. We're not just concerned about next year. Man, we, we want to position you for the years to come. I mean, there's just a culture that's brought. So we were, we were, we were doing that kind of coaching, if you will. And, and, um, and so we were just talking about in this time, uh, what, what would you need to know as a coach? You've got to know in this, in this time in, uh, in which we live, we've got to have our attention. And I mentioned those things. You've got to know the coach's voice. You've got to know the clock. And, and you've got to know your fans. But what set everything up and where we really were hooking up it, it was this, this idea that before we get started about anything, we need to know because you are all a part of the team. 
Like God set you here, and you're, he's called you to be a part of the team. Many are called, and we talked last night, it's the greatest draft of all time. Many are called, but few make arrangements to come. You can make an arrangement to come. The, all you got to do is send a letter of intent. And that letter of intent is signed with the words of your mouth. You believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you can enter his team. And you enter his team, and as, as this team, if he would be talking, he would say, guys, I need you to know this. I need you to know that, that, that this team, we are playing away. What does that mean? We are playing at an away gym. We are playing at an away stadium. We're not on our home turf. He- earth is not our home. Heaven is. home. Heaven is home. The, 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 we're to bring our kingdom to this place. We're to bring heaven's kingdom to this place. We're to show up and bring the buses and the fans and, and show up in this place and set our culture and, and you know, bring our song. We're, we're to bring that there. But we got, you got to know we are playing away. And, and though we're playing away, I want to remind you, and these are the two things that we, we, we're going to hit on, we're playing away, but we are playing more than just the other team. We're playing more than just the people on the field. We're playing more than Ephesians 6 says, we don't wrestle against, just, uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against, or our opponent is, our contest is between uh, but principalities, powers, rulers of wickedness. So, so we're not wrestling just against Satan, but you also are fighting the fans. It's something, you don't, sometimes we don't realize how much a home field advantage can play into a game, but it's real. How I many of you know it's, it's a real, real thing? And so there's voices that are in the, fan, in, in the stands, and if we listen to the wrong voices, how many of you know, uh, not just momentum, the outcome, the outcome will change, and that is the whole goal of fans and voices is to change the outcome. The outcome, and so just this morning, the title we yeah, Arkansas guy that goes with us. Oh yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, yeah. Okay, so there's a guy that all that you share that. Okay. Um, well, when he was talking about voices, and I thought um, we were at a baseball game. It was a few years ago, in I don't even know the name of the baseball field, but Arkansas field. And we heard this guy, and he was just hackling the left left fielder, yeah. and just I mean he he shared it for service, but just hackling him. Just he knew stuff that I was like, how do you even know that? Like his girlfriend, where he grew up, all the how, his stats of stuff that he's messed up on, and I mean he was just going, 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 and you could just see the left fielder like. Taking it, taking, taking it, it, taking it, taking it. By about then, the fourth inning, yeah. the the left fielder turns around, or he doesn't even turn around, but he's doing this. Yeah. Like, I hear you, you're running your mouth, but what's happened is it's distracted him from what's actually going on in the game. He shouldn't have ever been entering a conversation, but he was entering the conversation. Yeah. Because voices have play a great deal on the outcome of the game. They, they, they play a great deal on whether or not, listen, you and I come out. And so uh, this morning, just the voices that we listen to determine whether or not we do come out and how we come out, Right. Um, and so that would be the title of this morning's message is, is Come Out. And a couple of p- p- passages that we're going to look at is both the, the children of Israel and, you know, as they were, came out of Egypt, but they were to come out of the wilderness, right? And then also Lazarus as he came out of the grave. And um, if, you'll have, if you have your Bibles, real quick this, this morning, if you'll turn uh, with me to uh, the scripture, and I, I, I believe this will be a great jumping off point, um, the First Corinthians fourteen ten is that there's many voices in this world, but none of them are without significance. There is a lot of voices in this world. None of them are without significance. In other words, they have their origin in a place, and there's an intention from with with those voices. Listen, those that are for you, right? Your fans. John chapter 10, verse 10, tells us that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So there is a voice that would like to keep you contained and not let you out. But there's a voice that came and said, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. There's something about the voices that we're listening to. And it's so, so, so important that we're listening to the right voices. That we're listening to the right voices. That we would recognize that what voices that we are actually listening to. That we would, do you know that you have a choice? 
to which voice you listen to, which voice you entertain. Because the voice you, the, what you entertain has access to your heart. And where it gets in your heart, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, Proverbs chapter 4, says, as a man thinks in his heart, so, or excuse me, rather, guard your heart, Proverbs 4, uh, it says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flows the issues or the pathways of your life. There's something about Satan knows, and God knows, if I can get it in them, if I can get it in them, then their life, that course, that's the course they'll take. And so there is, there is a fight. There's a fight. There's a fight. And you know one of the number one ways that God gets it in you is love. I don't know how I'm, I'm getting off under here, but can, um, is love. You know, when you, you know how what happens when you know how much somebody loves you? What happens? You open up. You open up. This is why it's so important that we show, we, we love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. There's something powerful about love. It opens up. It opens up. So you want to make a deposit? Love. You know when God, God so loved the world, right? His love is what, what it enabled him to simply make the deposit, the seed of Jesus. If his love hadn't been present first, Jesus couldn't have came. Jesus couldn't have came. The change, the, the redemption, the finished work, the, 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 that which is impossible made possible, the, the brokenness restored, the, the healing or the, or the death uh, brought back to life, the, the sickness to health, the, 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 the chaos to peace, the, all of without love, none of it's possible. Why? Because in order for a seed to be sent, love must be present. In order for a seed to be received, a seed to be received, love has to be present. There's something about the love of God or the love of another that allows a word, which is why we or the word became flesh, Jesus, to be received. So don't think about speaking the truth without love, because you're not administering grace. All you're doing is driving a wedge. Love is what allows our hearts to open. There's something powerful about love. Well, you know how the, so this is how God works. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave, he gave, he gave, right? So what are you giving right now? Just let me ask you this. What are you giving to, in, in the relationship right now that you're struggling with? I don't know how we're getting off on this all the way. I'm just going from my heart. What are you struggling? What are you giving right now? What kind of words are you giving? What kind of, what kind of time are you giving, what kind, of, what kind of things that actually cost you are you giving? What is, because I'll tell you what it'll do, it'll open up, it'll open up the heart to receive, right? And it'll also open up your heart. Because sometimes it's not it's opening up their heart, it's opening up your heart to them to have the connection that you desire. Okay? So you need to open, open your heart and allow the seed of God's word to take root. But there's also a, a way that Satan works. See, see, God, God, wants, God works through love, but Satan works this way. He wants to get something into you as well. He wants to get something into you. And the way that he gets it into you is by getting you and I to take a thought of offense. Of offense. You know, the Bible, I don't have the, the, it's in there, but the Bible tells us that where there is offense and strife and discord, there is every evil work. I want to paint this picture to you because this is really significant of how I, I, I believe the enemy works. When he, uh, there's a book called The Bait of Satan by John Brevere. And um, there are certain things that the enemy will come at you with and you know to leave that alone. How many know what I'm talking about? Like, you just don't even really entertain that thought. He might have got you that way before and got in that door, but you know that one is like he can't really get in that door very well, right? Like you just like, you recognize that's the devil, right? Okay, so you just, and you know if you, if you, if you, if he got in there, you know that you've been playing with the devil, right? But you know to get out of that spot. And so Satan knows in his job, he, he, his goal is to bring destruction to your life, to steal, kill, and to destroy and, and if he has a certain thing that would bring total destruction to your life, but he can't get in there, he's going to get in by changing the bait. And he'll change the bait. And here's how he starts. It's the same way that he started in the garden. 
It's the same way that he tried to come at Jesus with. It's the same way he tried to, he, he, he got in with the children of Israel after 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted 40 days. You know what he was tempted with more than anything? Is the same thing that Satan was tempted with. Or not Satan, but Adam was tempted with. And that's being offended with God. Offense. Offense is the bait that he comes with. Offense, to open us up, to get offended with pastor, to get offended with your wife, to get offended with your children, to get offended with somebody, to get offended with God. Because see, what you entertain, right, what you entertain has access into your life. This is why it's so important for you to watch, what are you watching at home? On TV. I'm not telling you what to watch. I'm just telling you what you entertain, you're giving access to your life. Let it ride right on in. Remember Miss Billy Brim, she talked about how, how the enemy, you know, like spirit, right? Can you see spirit? Is it real? Absolutely. So it's talking about how, uh, I can't remember, um, uh, old, old time, I say old timer of faith. I mean, uh, one that didn't have the internet to look up a verse, that they actually had to read it. You know, when they were looking for healing, they had to find it. I mean, you know, there's something about, those, there's something about buying gold and there's something about mining gold. Right? So these guys, anyway, they're talking about how, how like the enemy would ride in, like on waves, like almost like, you know, just kind of, anyway, and just how into our homes, you know what we do? We turn on a voice. We turn a voice on with country music that wants to pet how I feel. I, I like, I mean, I want to put a little gravel in my travel too, take a back road. I mean, come on. She thinks my tractor, you know, she likes my tractor, you know, um, but out in the past, you know, we could, we'll ride a tractor, but I don't have a green tractor anymore either, so, um, but this is very true, that you are actually entertaining not just thoughts, but voices, okay, that have a plan to get you to, 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 to self, uh, self, self-assess, you know, the Bible says this, this, it tells us that when, uh, if you're going to follow after me, you're going to have to take up your cross and deny yourself. But a lot of the stuff we're do- doing and listening to is, <sighs> right? Petting self. And so we, we set ourselves. So just, be, just, just know what you, what you entertain, you are giving access to. Oh, it's not that bad. They just say F this or that. or It's not that bad, but... The, the, the husband and wife is completely disrespectful. They don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's not that bad, but, I mean, you're, we're watching. The, I'm going to tag on one. I'm going to tag on one. It's not that bad, but we're all just living together in college students, you know, and I'll be here for you. No, no, I'm just telling you that, that you're, you want that in your house? Bring that in your house. Bring that into your children if that's what you want for your children. Just allow these voices to paint pictures because that's what words do. They paint pictures. They paint pictures to the scenery that we now walk in. It's, we got to be careful on what we entertain. Why? Because what I entertain, gives, I give access to in my life. I want my children, but it's not a fearful thing. This is a wise thing. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, what they don't know. What you don't know could be killing you. Fact. It could be killing you. So give what you give access, what you give, what you entertain. What you, and you know, I, I love the, the, this, this word. I've, um, you will never have authority over what you entertain. I've heard, I uh, can't remember who, who said that. I think it was maybe Pastor Bill Johnson or maybe somebody else. Um, but I remember Trey telling me, uh, we were in a conversation, and you will never have authority over what you entertain. Think about that. You're going to entertain you're going to entertain these thoughts? Guess what you won't have? You won't have authority over it. Why? Because you are being entertained by it. You, when, you put, you, when you are being entertained by something, let me show you what happens. You put whatever it is, and you sit yourself under it. I just want you to see the big screen, and I want you to see position and see how you are surrendered underneath the authority of what you're being entertained by. You can't have authority under, uh, over what you entertain. Why? Because it's got authority over you. It's got, what, what, why? Because you just gave it access to your life. Come in. Speak to me. Have your way. 
And so it's why it's so important what are we listening to, and it's so important whose voice are we listening to. You know how God wants to get access? It's through love. You know how Satan wants to get access? He wants to get access through offense, through getting us to take a thought and get offended with God, get offended with another, get offended, and and here's what happens is those things that were on the outside, like of your house, how many of you know, like there's the gate of your heart right, that you won't let certain things in, you know that that thought to like just go shoot them is probably not good, right, you're like, yeah, that's probably the devil, you know, <laughs> but, but, right, <laughs> and that's, that's an extreme case, but you know how someone gets murdered, not in a moment, murders of the heart, the Bible says, murder is of the heart, and this is why he said, if you hate, if you say, I hate you, like, like it talks about how it's of the heart. It starts of the heart. You got to understand that there are the things that you say ain't no way ever going to happen. Maybe like that secretary at work because you're happily married with three kids and it's just not going to happen, right? Get offended and see if it does. Get offended with your wife. Get offended with your wife and how blah, blah, blah. Get, just get offended. Just, just take that thought. Make a choice, because that's what you're doing, to listen to that word that would be, whether it's, is it bringing life or is it bringing death? Find out where, choose, choose life. That's the one I tell you, entertain life. Don't entertain death, but entertain life. But if if you're going to entertain that death thought, what happens is, the Bible tells us that where where strife, discord, where where there is offense, uh, there's every evil work. So why? Because all you did is you just said, come on in, devil. And so there are things, there are things that you would, would, that were on the outside of you, and you would never let in. But because offense got in, because ought got in, if, you, if there's ought in your heart, ought towards God, ought towards wrong thought. If ought is the pro- a product of what you're thinking on, wrong thought. And what happens is Satan can come in and he can do whatever you want. And your deep end, let me tell you, if you're listening to the wrong thoughts, it's not that far off. Like, the deep end's right there. Like, wrong thought, the deep end's right there. It's not like it's a slow fade. It's called open the door, whoop, step out, fall. This is how Satan wants to work. You know, he, he wants to utterly destroy you, like, right now and have you live through hell all the way, not just kind of go to hell. The thoughts we listen to, voices are huge, huge. And so if we're going to come out, if we're going to come out on top, we're going to have to recognize what voice we're listening to, what voice we're entertaining. And, and you know, we can give a lot of lip service. A lot of times we do. We say, you know, and I'm going to tell on myself here, like, where I got offended with one of my kids, okay? It's just, this happened this week. I, um, and she told me, don't let the devil, you know, um, you know, this is just a strategy of the devil, you know, and I'm like, something <laughs> I was like, I know, or, you know, or I, I don't know, I, I was just like, I was probably more like inside, the voice was like, shut up. It was coming across on your face. It was coming across on my face? <laughs> oh, that's right, because the Bible does say that what's in the heart is seen on the face, so, hey, it's... It, it, it was just a look like... It was more like, shut up, I know that the B-team night's coming up, and I know I'm really excited in my heart, but the devil's trying to steal, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, I know, I know, I know, but I just am entertaining I want to be mad, still. yeah. I'm, I don't, and I didn't want to be mad. I, I, I didn't want to be mad. Here's what happened. I come home uh, two days early from a hunting trip that was on my calendar for the whole year. This one, this is my time. I'm not taking somebody, this is me. Why? I come late. I leave early. That doesn't happen on that time. It's not 15 bucks in one day, okay? This is a good time, okay? But I come home early. I drive late, and I get home. It's like midnight, and I get up the next morning, and I get up early to make pancakes and sausage and eggs and a smoothie and, like, you know, love on these kids of mine. And when they wake up, I mean, I'm in the kitchen, and I'm, I'm wore out. I mean, because they're up early, up late, up and drove late. And the, one of my, my children comes in, and, and they, they go, oh, you're here? Yeah, and you're lucky you're still alive at the moment, because I'm about to wipe. <laughs> that was the immediately voice I listened to. It's like, no, like, okay, maybe he's going to come and give me a hug, you know, and tell you how much I love you, and, 
you know, worship you. Because it's going to take that at this point. Because how many of you know they can't do anything right from there on? And so everything they said was now filtered from the voice that I made a choice that, oh, you're here. And so she said, what's going on? I said, and then he says, oh, you're here? And she said, she said, well, I don't think he meant it like that. Oh, he didn't mean like that. Uh, I think he meant it like that. I think, and then, and then, and then. I need to just get, get alone for a little bit to get my heart right. That's what I told her. So I went away. All right, all right, all right. And then, you know, the thought was still in there. So I changed my voice, but I didn't really make a choice to do this. Forgive. Or to not count. And to, I didn't make the choice. I changed what I'd said. I changed what, but how many of you know, you can use your voice all you want. You can say, you can say this, and this is, I have a hard time sometimes on, on worship songs, you know, where they break, they, we sing directives, like, we sing like, falling down on my knees in worship, no, I'm not, am I meaning anything I say, I should just keep singing now. I wonder if there's truth in me today, or if I'm just filling a box and my hands are getting tired. I wonder what's for lunch. <laughs> God, if you're real at all, maybe. I wonder if I believe what I am doing here. Maybe I should just not. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff that because we're singing, we're saying, we're talking, but we're really not aware of that I'm really making a choice. And the choice is of the heart. And so I didn't make the choice with my child. I changed my words, but I didn't change my choice. Oh, I like the, oh, have you seen the commercial uh, about the red car and the, uh, the gray truck? The, girl, the lady comes and buys an early Christmas present for the, for the husband, a black watch and a, a red watch. And she goes, honey, I, I did some early Christmas shopping. And she gives two watches and gives him the black watch, and she's got a red watch. And he's like, oh. I did a little early Christmas shopping of my own. And so he goes, come outside. And he opens the door, and there's this gray Chevy Silverado, and then there's this, this uh, cherry red uh, or, or um, a Tahoe. And she goes, <gasps> and runs over to the red one, and then she go, or the, the gray one, and she goes, I love it. And he goes, that was supposed to be my, um, I like red. <laughs> he didn't like red. He didn't want red. But he said, I like red. But what was still in his heart was, she got my truck. Right? And that's where I was at. I was very, 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 very at. And, and it took me to a place where I, I, was, I was offended, straight up offended with my child because of listening to the wrong voice. And I'll tell you, um, that was, that was two, uh, Thursday morning, Thursday night. There was some rocky road a little bit, you know, not ice cream. Uh, right? Uh, Friday, there was maybe a little more Rocky Road. Morning, we ate Rocky Road for breakfast, lunch, dinner, it's like lunch and dinner, um, but by that evening, maybe still just had to clean out the box of the Rocky Road, and because uh, I knew that B-team night was Saturday night, and she said, Aren't we going to, I'm like, I'm not doing that tonight. We're not studying. We're not doing that. I don't know. So Saturday morning, we're getting prepped. And it's like, in my heart, it's like, I got to make a choice. Because if I don't make this choice, ain't nothing going to come out this right. And, and the choice I make affects more than me. Mm. Not just because I'm leading a church. Listen, the choice you make affects more than you. So it's really significant on what you entertain, the voices you entertain, you give access to. And the enemy, I can tell you, in just, in just that amount of time, just, a, just that, in a moment, he jumped right in. And, and you know, I, and my son didn't know what to do. 
because he couldn't do anything because he wasn't the cause of it. Yet I assigned it to him. Yet I assigned it to him. But I was actually wrestling principalities and fans. Voices. Additional voices. Well, other people's family, look at how they're loving them. Look at, you know, I mean, this, the enemy's ridiculous. It'll get you down the road. You're like, how could you get there? It's that quick. Not, not making a choice and not recognizing which voice am I listening to. And if we listen to the right voices, we'll come out. We'll, we'll, we'll come out and we'll, we'll, win the, we'll win this battle. We'll win tomorrow's battle. We'll win the battle with our children. We'll win the battle in our marriage. We'll win the ma- battle in our finances. We'll win the battle. Listen, we'll come out. And it takes you and I, listen, not being offended at God. In the, the story uh, in, 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 with the children of Israel, they began to murmur and complain after 40 days. They were offended. I saw miracle after miracle after miracle. But what was happening was, is, is they were getting offended with God saying, you took us out of Egypt and now you're, we're in this wilderness. We're all in this for 40 days. There. Now you're going to tell us to take out of the land where there's giants in the land. I, I thought you loved us taking us out here to die. But somebody had a different, was listening to a different voice and they were seeing a picture, an anchor. They had an anchor for their soul and that was Joshua and Caleb. And what they saw is they, Hebrews chapter 6 tells us there's an anchor, a hope. And this hope, a picture, a promise from God is an anchor for our soul. So we're not up and down. So we're not in a place where we're being destroyed, right? But we have an anchor and they had this anchor and they saw a picture of promise. They saw that land as a place that God was taking them to, right? They, that's what was still in their heart. They weren't offended with God. They were thankful. And you know, so if you want to get, stop getting offended with God, get thankful. Amen. Get thankful. Get thankful. This is the same thing that happened with, with Jesus and, and, and Lazarus. Man, Jesus was weeping because Lazarus had died. He is, he is every right. Have you been there? He has the choice to be offended with God because God, he never went anywhere except the Father told him, how come you didn't send me there to help my friend? But he had every, every reason. But instead, as you look through, he comes there and he, the first words out of his mouth, besides, he answers about how God he will raise him up. God will raise him up. So a picture is still in his heart for Lazarus. There's still a picture, a hope that hasn't changed. As long as that hope is there that in your heart, that anchor right there will, will hold you to a place where your mouth, right, it's, the right things are coming out. And it goes on. The first thing he says as he talks to the Lord is not a murmur and not a complaint. It's this, I thank you that you hear me always. And then the words of his mouth was, come, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. And so the, my, this morning, my, our heart for you, and what we see in our heart is this, this morning, that there would be a coming out for you this morning. Like if, if there's a offense and there's things in your heart, that simply by changing, uh, by, by choosing rather, the voice that you're listening to and, and, and turning it on. I just saw thankfulness, even just while we were ministering here this morning, that, that, that you would grab a hold of, thank you, Lord, that you'd grab a hold of thank you, Lord. And as we close this morning, we're going to, we're going to, uh, I don't know, is that okay? Somebody still do that? I don't even look at, I, know, I don't even look at the time anymore because I, yeah. So, um, but we're going to close this morning's mess, uh, service uh, with the altar. Do you have something you want to say something? Yeah, I just had something come to me um, when he was sharing there and about the word peacemaker. Hmm. And um, I just felt like there's people in here um, you're to make the peace. Like, it's on you. Like he said, he assigned that to one of our sons. All the blame. And you know what? The, the person that you've assigned that to, they can't make the peace. Like, it's you. It, it's called peacemaker because you're to make the peace. And I don't know if you said it this service or, or if it was um, first service, but what are, what are you at... In your relationships, what are you giving? What are you giving in that? Without, like, God, for God so loved the world that he gave. And it, it doesn't go on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave, knowing only that he's giving when that person receives it. Like, your, your relationship 
What are you doing to make peace and what are you doing to give without something in return? Yeah, release. Like my giving toward my spouse, my giving toward my kids or other relationships isn't or shouldn't be based on I'm giving this and I'm not going to give it again unless I see something. Like I'm giving this one time, but if, if that's not reciprocated back to me, psh, I ain't giving no more. I'm tired of giving. All I do is give. I said that. He did say that, but I wasn't saying that because of that. But what, what the enemy gets us over into that, I give so much. I give so much all the time. And what is it doing? It's, it's that offense. It's that it's all about me. What is it really focused on myself? How much I give all the time, how much I love all the time, how much I'm doing, and that person isn't doing anything for me. But we're called to do what? Peace make. If it's up to me, that's the decision we have to come to. If it's up to me to make peace, then I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to make peace. And you know what? I don't have control over Mona's decision, but I have control over my decision. Right. And my decision is unconditional love. My decision is unending giving. My decision is making peace. Amen. My decision is my heart. Not Mona's heart, not anyone else's heart. My decision is my heart. What's, what's in my ability to do with my own heart? Amen. So um, we did want to do the, the altar here this morning. And um, we just sent so, so strong over these services today. Just if there's stuff that you've been battling, whether it be offense, whether it be, you know, it may be with God. It may be with others. It may be whatever it might be. You've just been struggling. Then use this altar time to come before the Lord and let him minister to you like only he can do. Right. And you know what? There's something about the altar. He, he shared that. There's something about the altar where it consumed. You know, when they put their, that sacrifice on the altar, sometimes it can be a sacrifice to come up front because you know what it is speaking? What are people thinking? People think I'm a bad person. People think, no, 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 no. This is not about other people. This is about what God's wanting to do in you. And you know what? It wouldn't be called a sacrifice if it wasn't a sacrifice. It meant something. It means laying down my pride. It means laying down my offense. It means laying down my struggles so that God can come at the altar and consume that. And that's what the altar is there for. It's not for other people. That's between you and God to let him do the work that he can do.